Hi everybody, this is video number 6 in our garden automation series where we take control of our grows with Home Assistant. In this one we're going to tackle our first node red automation and look at controlling a dumb humidifier using values that we set from the user interface. You can check out the last video for help getting your humidity sensor in place and part 4 for getting your Wi-Fi smart plug set up. First off, a huge thank you to those who have donated since the last video. Shout out to N27, Morbid9, Best Inc, and a few others who preferred to remain unnamed. Thank you guys so much for helping me to continue to buy parts and cover costs required to produce these videos. One more thing to mention before getting started, I have posted all my code for my system to my GitHub repo, including all Home Assistant configuration files, Arduino code for the ESP32 and Mega in my control box, as well as a system diagram drawing and a parts list. So check out the link in the video description below if you're interested in seeing how my system works. Okay, let's go. So I've been learning Node-RED slowly myself over the last little while, and I'm really enjoying it. As I mentioned in my past videos, there are already some great videos on YouTube if you're looking to get into Node Red, and I'd recommend you watch them before getting into this because I'm not going to reinvent the wheel and make a video on it myself. So I'll assume a little bit of working knowledge, but we'll still try to explain things as I go. Our goal for this video is to create an automation to turn a humidifier on and off based on a target level that we set from our Home Assistant dashboard. I think this will be a good example because the methods we use to achieve this can be applied to a bunch of completely different automations. So in my demo system here I have humidity values that are streaming in from three Ruby tags and I have a TP-Link HS105 smart outlet that I'll be using to turn my humidifier on and off. It's important to grab a humidifier that starts immediately as soon as you provide power to it and doesn't require you to press any buttons to get it going. Here's my plan for how I'll control my humidifier. I'm going to start by going to the configuration tab in Home Assistant and then helpers and I'm going to add two input numbers. The first one is going to be called humidity target and I'll give it the water percent icon, a 0 to 100 range is good, and I want it to be a slider with a step size of 5, and the unit of measurement will be percent. Okay, now I'm going to add a second one, and I'll call this humidity tolerance. I'm not going to use an icon for this one, and I'll give it a 0 to 20 range with a step size of 1, and the percent unit of measurement. I'll return to my dashboard and add these two in an entities card. We're going to use this top slider to set our target humidity and then we'll adjust the second slider to tell the system how far the values can be out of range before it takes action. You know what I mean? So if we didn't include the second slider and just had the target at 50%, if the sensor was reading 49%, the system would be turning the humidifier on and then it'd be shutting it off as soon as it hits 50% and the cycle would repeat. So it'd be turning the switch on and off pretty much every time the sensor provided us data if it was near the target anyway. You might want this, but I prefer to give a little leeway. So with this tolerance, I'm saying if our target is 50% and tolerance is 5%, the system will let the humidity get up to 55% before turning the switch off and it won't turn it back on until it dips to 45%. You could easily hard code this number but why not give ourselves the ability to adjust it with the second slider, right? Alright, we have all our ingredients for the automation now. I'm gonna check my config and restart Home Assistant now just to make sure that these new helpers are available to me. And I'm back. And I'll hop into Node Red, and we are finally here. Woohoo! I'm going to walk through adding things step by step, but I'm also going to provide you with some code that you can import that will load all the blocks for you as well. So if you don't want to add one by one, you can just import my code at the end of the video. This big empty grid we're looking at is called a flow. You can add or delete them by hitting this button in the top right and going down to flow. We'll rename this one to humidifier control. On the left are all the nodes that are available to us. These are the blocks that we'll build the automation with. The blue ones at the top are all related to Home Assistant, and these are the blocks we're going to use to pull values from our sensors and sliders. The rest of the blocks below are your basic node red nodes. 
I'm going to start by pulling in three events state blocks. So these nodes will fire off a message on their output every time that their state changes. And the payload of that message will be the new value of the entity that they represent. So I'll double click the first one and I want this one to be for our humidity target slider. In entity ID, I'll start typing input underscore number, and it should suggest all the input numbers we have in Home Assistant. If you can't see these autocomplete suggestions after creating the helpers, then restart Home Assistant and try again. So I'll select the humidity target entity, then I'm going to change the state type from string to number. I'm also going to select output on connect, just because I want to make sure that this thing reads my slider on startup, even if I don't change it. I'll do the same thing again, and this time I'll pick the tolerance input number, change it to a number type, and output on connect. Okay, now I'll add my third event state block. This one is going to be my sensor.ruvy humidity, and we'll just go with the 4x4 one. It's going to be updating itself plenty, so I'll just leave the output on connect unchecked. I'm not worried about that thing reporting. Cool, so let's test these things and see if they're working. I'll drag a debug node up for all three and connect them up. And hit this deploy button to push all the changes. So every time you make a change, if you want it to actually be enacted, you have to hit this deploy button. So now if I change over to debug mode in the top right with this little icon, I'll clear everything and you can see it's currently debugging all nodes, which means every single debug node you have in node red will be reporting to this window. You can change it so it only looks at debug nodes on the current flow, or you can select exactly which nodes you want to see. If you want to pick a particular node to view, you can mouse over the available ones and they'll also get highlighted in orange to show which one you're currently hovering on. So if I wanted to only show information for my humidity target debug node, I'd just select this one. Now let's go and change our slider to see if this works. I'm just going to duplicate this tab so I can switch back and forth easily. So now, every time the state of the slider changes, it sends out a message with the new value. You could do away with the other two debug nodes and just tie all three to a single one as well, which makes more sense. Now all the messages that these nodes send are reported by the same debug block, and you can tell which is which by the topic of the message, which is shown in orange. Alright, this is where things get a little bit more complex. I was kind of surprised that I had to jump through these hoops to get my idea to work, but stay with me here and don't be intimidated by this. It's only this way because I'm using these two variables in the front end. If you wanted to do this the super simple way, you just hard code it like this. You would take the state of the Ruby humidity sensor, connect it to a switch node and say if the value coming in is less than the humidity that you want, say 50%, so I'll just put a 50 here, then send your message out output one. And you'll add another output that says, if the value from the sensor is more than 50, send your message out output two. We'd then add two call service blocks and connect them to output one and two. The first one would be switch.turn on, and we'd pick our TP link entity. And then the second would be switch.turn off for the same entity. So the value comes in from the Ruby, the switch decides which output to pulse by sending a message, and it'll either turn the humidifier on or off. Very simple, but too simple, I think. Back to our plan. What we're going to do is join all these three values into a single message rather than working with three discrete messages. I think this is cleaner. So I'll drag a join block up.
and configure it. I'm going to select a manual join that combines all the message payloads and creates a key value object using the message.topic as the key. I want the message to be sent when it receives data from all three blocks, so I'll put a three here, and I want every subsequent message as well, so I'll leave that checked. Let's debug this now, and I'll show you what we've created. Now, when the Ruby sensor gets read, and it gets read in like a burst of five times, I'll have all three payloads come in together in the same message. Here's my target, tolerance, and sensor readings before they'd be in three separate boxes. Now what we'll do is feed this join into a function node. This is the best way I could think of to do what I want to do. The function node lets you write a little chunk of code to do just about anything you want, so it's really flexible. We're going to write a function that takes the information coming into the node in the form of our message.payload from our join node, and then sends a message.payload out one of two outputs. The first thing I'll do is change the number of outputs to two on my function node, and then I think this will make more sense for everyone if I finish the whole chain and come back to fill in the function node. So I want the function to do two things, either turn on our humidifier or turn off our humidifier. First I'll add a call service node. The domain is going to be switch because that's what we're controlling. The service for this one will be turn on and the entity ID will be the home assistant entity ID of our switch. So switch.tplink1 in my case. Done. Now I'm just going to copy this with control C on my keyboard and paste with control V. This is going to be my turn off command, so all I need to do is change the service from turn on to turn off. I'll connect these to my function block and I'm done. So let's look at the whole chain. We have data coming in from our home assistant entities. They get joined into a single message which feeds our function block. Then the function block is going to look at that data and either pulse the first output which will turn the humidifier outlet on or pulse the second one to turn the outlet off. Let's write the function. We're going to say if the value of the incoming message.payload, specifically the sensor.ruvi humidity 4x4 value of the payload, is less than our message.payload input number humidity target. minus the message.payload input number dot humidity tolerance then forward our message payload on the first output of the block and the second output will get a null or nothing so if the condition in this if statement between the parentheses is true the stuff between these curly braces here gets run. You can think of this return part as sort of what actually is going to pulse the first output with information, and it's going to be doing nothing with the second one. All right, now on the flip side, if the incoming value of the humidity sensor is greater than our target plus the tolerance, we will do nothing on the first output and we're going to pulse the second output with our message. So the order of items between these square brackets is the same order as the outputs on the node. The first item is the top one and so on and so forth. Let me write out an example and step through it with you. Let's say we have our humidity target set to 50, the tolerance to 5, and the Ruby sensors reading say 34. Every single time any of these values change, the function is going to reevaluate them. So in this case, the message comes in and we say if the value of the Ruby humidity sensor, which is 34, is less than the target, which is 50, minus the tolerance, which is 5, we are going to pulse this message out the first output. So is 34 less than 50 minus 5? Yes. We forward the message out the first output and that's that. The function ends here. Now let's say the Ruby was reading 65% humidity. The function starts from the top, 
Is 65 less than 50 minus 5? No. So the conditions for this if statement at the top are not met, and the stuff inside it doesn't run, it moves on to the next check. So if the first thing is not true, it goes to the else if part of the statement, which is asking, is the Ruby sensor reading greater than the target plus the tolerance? And if it is, we send our payload out the second output. So is 65 greater than 50 plus 5? Yes. So the stuff between the curly braces runs and we send nothing on the first output and then send our message on the second output. In this case, the actual payload or the contents of the message doesn't really matter. We're just forwarding on the same combined info that we got from our join node. It's the act of receiving this message that actually triggers our call service nodes. So our payload could just be the word cheese or anti-disestablishmentarianism, and the call service would get activated when it received it. Apparently it's good practice to retain information when possible in node red, just in case you might need it down the line. So I'm going to leave the message untouched, but of course there will be times when you need to change the payload, so do whatever works. As I mentioned earlier, every time the state of any of these three blocks change, we're going to be pulsing the turn on or turn off service. So if our rubies read every 60 seconds, we're going to pulse a turn on or turn off every minute. And I don't think there's any harm in Home Assistant calling that switch turn on service or turn off service repeatedly if the switch is already on or already off, but you could prevent this with a current state block if you wanted to. So we could add two current states before the call service blocks that act sort of like if statements. For the switch.turnon service, we could say in our current state node that we only want to pass the message if the switch we're turning on is currently off. Now this block won't pass the message down the chain if the switch is already on, and it'll prevent Home Assistant from spamming that call service every minute. And the reverse would be true for switch.turnoff. We can say that we only want this message to go through if the current state of the switch is on. If it's already off, don't keep telling it to turn off. Let's put this whole thing to the test now. I can see here that my humidity sensor is reading somewhere around 27.5% right now. I'll just pull up my other window so I can mess with the sliders here. So I also see that my humidifier smart plug is currently on, our humidity target is set to 35%, and the tolerance is set to 5%. So let's start messing with the target. If I drag the target down to 25%, nothing is going to happen. In order to turn this plug off, the reading would have to be higher than the target plus the tolerance, which would add up to 30% right now. Now let's tighten the tolerance down. Once I get down to 2% tolerance, the switch shuts off immediately because the value of the sensor is coming in at 27.5% and that's higher than my target plus my tolerance which would be 27%. If I move the target back up so the reading is less than the target minus the tolerance, the switch turns back on. If we step our tolerance back up, the whole thing becomes less sensitive to changes overall. Right on, it works. One last thing I want to cover is exporting and importing in Node Red. Here's the best way to export. Click the menu in the top right and hit export. Pick what you want to export. I will export my current flow and copy to clipboard. Now go to this website, which I'll link in the description, and paste in your exported text. Hit scrub and copy the results to your clipboard. So this removes any GPS coordinates from the nodes to protect your privacy and it also removes references to your home assistant server which is a big one. If you don't do this and somebody imports your flow they're going to end up with references to two separate home assistant servers in node red which is a pain in the butt to sort out because you have to figure out which is which and delete the one that isn't actually yours. I've got my scrub config now I'm going to show you how to import it. Under the same menu you hit import paste the config in and boom Now you just got to go through and change the entity IDs for all the Home Assistant blocks to the proper IDs that you have in your Home Assistant config. So there it is, our first Node Red automation. If you're a Node Red expert and you have a better way to do this, please share it in the comments. As I said earlier, I'm learning this too and I might be overlooking a simpler solution so I'm all ears. But this works and it was fun to piece together. 
Thanks for watching, everybody. If you're digging this content, please help me out and do all the YouTube stuff for me. Like the video, leave a comment, subscribe with notifications on, you know the drill. And we'll see you on the next one.